we're three videos deep into covering Etrian Odyssey, and after the first two games tested their footing, it was the third one that moved forward to tread new ground. So let's dive right into the depths with Etrian Odyssey 3. Etrian Odyssey 3 follows your group of adventurers on yet another journey into a labyrinth located near a town. This time around, the dungeon isn't making the seaside town of Armor Road prosperous. Instead, its rich history sank to the bottom of the ocean floor as the appearance of the dungeon swallowed up half of the town. Armor Road had once been a prosperous place with advanced technology, with close ties to all the other harbors in the world. The sinking of the city also distorted the seas and now the town finds itself stuck. Lamenting the loss of their golden age as the town's rulers obsess over what's inside the dungeon. So adventurers come to seek out the dungeon, establishing a new trade economy centered around it, while the Senatus hopes that a group one day will reclaim the town's lost glory. So before we dive into the dungeon, let's take a look at our party this time because it's a special one. I guess that's what I get for taking so long with this video, huh? For Etrian Odyssey 3, I thought it only made sense to go with Hololive's third generation. So the fantasy generation became the basis for the party's lineup, and it's not just because they're both a third generation of something. The general idea was having Hosho Marin as a buccaneer because her theme song, Ahoy, was created with the help of Iosis. The same Iosis who made that old FOE flash animation for the first Etrian Odyssey game. It's a nice way to bookend the DS trilogy, especially after having mentioned Amelia Watson in the first video. Unfortunately, Buccaneers aren't exactly the best class in the game, and for the first half of the game, Marine kind of existed as the party's cute mascot character. The class's central gimmick is supposed to be its chase skills, allowing them to chase after certain damage types to repeatedly hit enemies outside of their own turn. Unfortunately, this central gimmick is also kind of just terrible. But the late game skill Pincushion more than makes up for that. Shirogane Noel perfectly fits one of the Hoplite sprites, which is good because I wanted one of those either way. I wanted at least one reliable tank who can cover damage for the party. Hoplite's defensive abilities cover one row at a time, drastically reducing damage taken from the incoming attacks. Beyond this, they can also reduce elemental attacks for a turn, something that's especially useful later on. Shiranui Flair became my Arbalist. When Marine wasn't ready to pull her weight as a physical damage dealer yet, the front row assault capabilities that Arbalists bring to the table more than made up for it. It feels kind of weird having a ranged unit be especially good at the front row, but Etrian Odyssey 3 classes can get pretty unconventional. Having elemental damage attacks that hit all enemies made the bigger encounters in the game a lot more manageable too. Usada Pekora was a perfect fit for the Hype Princess sprite. Where most classes in Etrian Odyssey 3 do a few things very well, giving you the ability to grow them in a few hyper-specific ways, the Sovereign class goes the exact opposite direction, opening up that skill tree to get a little bit of everything. They might be the busiest class covering the most ground in the game. Their central mechanic revolves around three turn buffs they give out to a single row at a time. Increasing attack, bolstering defense, giving out health regen, lowering debuff hit chances. They do a lot. They even get an ability that erases enemy buffs, which becomes increasingly important during boss fights over time. But on top of that, they have so much passive heal regen built into their kit too, making the Sovereign incredibly useful for prolonged sustainability inside of a dungeon. Bonus health regen when applying a buff to party members. Bonus health regen when they're at full health at the end of the turn. Bonus health regen if they're alive at the end of battle. Oh, and bonus health regen every step inside of the dungeon. The last one being able to outpace the pain of damage tiles. The Hype Princess yells at the peasant party members to hit harder, but they're also why the party gets to keep pushing for as long as they can. It's the top tier character class of the third generation. Oh no, oh god no, please don't. And finally, we have Uduharusia as a Zodiac. Zodiacs are mostly traditional mages, focusing on elemental damage spells. 
Though, interestingly enough, the bonus damage from hitting enemies with the correct spell is an ability that you put more points into for a bigger effect this time around. What they're mostly known for, though, is nuking the hell out of everything by throwing meteorites at enemies randomly. Alternatively, they can become a battery, letting a row cast abilities for free, so Marine and Flare could just cast their big damage nukes for free during prolonged boss fights in the late game. You might have already noticed it, but Etrian Odyssey 3 drastically shook up the class names, moving away from traditional role names and instead going for something a bit more different and out there, giving it a much more distinct and unique flavor. This already started with Etrian Odyssey 2's Gunner technically having a kit somewhere between a magic user, healer, and a ranged physical attacker. But in Etrian Odyssey 3, this is every class. And the renaming isn't just for flavor reasons, it also calls extra attention to the player that they can't just think about their lineup the way that they did in Etrian Odyssey 1 or 2. Things work differently now, so you actually have to pay attention to the changes. Etrian Odyssey 3's classes tend to be more hyper-focused towards a single task in doing that especially well, with different possible builds to focus on those smaller individual tasks. While team compositions and the challenges in the game become more about using all of them to eliminate blind spots in your lineup. Basically, you don't want everyone to be an all-encompassing powerhouse, you want your team to be a well-oiled machine where everyone has their use. But we'll get into the how or why after we've taken our first few steps into the dungeon. Etrian Odyssey 3's dungeons are my favorite of the Nintendo DS era of the series. A lot was learned from what they experimented with during the second game, and for the most part, it works out great. Again, much like Etrian Odyssey 2, everything is a lot more 3D here. There's less knee-high blockages this time around, though. But you do get impassable areas like water and pitfalls that you're supposed to map what you can see behind them, to help you figure out the locations of future areas, or in some cases, secret areas. One of the biggest annoyances with Etrian Odyssey 2 was that a lot of the hidden wall passages were hidden a little too well. Etrian Odyssey 3 tends to have some pretty obvious gaps in its maps that makes it obvious that there's an entrance somewhere in the surrounding walls. Regular shortcuts tend to be placed in such a way where you'll likely move forward towards the edge of a hallway and see the interaction prompt show up. They're not trying to hide them in the middle of an extremely long hallway with nothing to show for it in this game, this alone makes it a massive upgrade from the second game. A lot of the floors are centered around navigational puzzles, often with a shortcut at the end so that once you've made it clear to the game that you understood it, you don't have to do them again. The way Etrian Odyssey 3 handles those post-area shortcuts is especially nice because it means that it can be worth it to push that little bit further once you've figured out how to get past an area, since the reward is permanently being able to move past it faster now. So, let's talk about that thing that wears your party down and forces you to use that warp wa- I mean, Ariadna thread to go back. Combat. Combat in Etrian Odyssey 3 feels like it's the main thing that's largely stayed consistent with the previous entries. Presentation and all. So you still get your party of five members filling six slots. And although some of the random encounters can hit hard, they're not especially remarkable. Where Etrian Odyssey 3 makes a big difference, however, is the boss fights and how the character classes play out. Boss fights have gotten a bit more fleshed out and involved compared to the previous two entries. In both Etrian Odyssey 1 and 2, there'd be a chance they'd do this big strong attack every now and again, or cast a buff or debuff, and that's all you really had to look out for. Ensuring you don't put yourself in a position that compromises your party when those abilities come up. Etrian Odyssey 3 bosses tend to have actual central gimmicks and mechanics. Like the first boss needs to be backed into a corner and approached from a secret passage in a wall. This way you lock him into a dirt field so he can't run away. And then you start the fight by getting the jump on him. Once the fight started, he tends to burrow himself underground after a while. With multiple fields you can attack in the hopes of digging him up but also potentially making you waste your big single-target attack if you weren't paying attention. 
Unless you've got an AoE attack ready to put a stop to this game of hide and seek immediately. This isn't the only boss with mechanics like these, and I like this direction that the fights have taken. There's a lot of mid-bosses on floors too, so there's not just content blocking boss fights at the end of each stratum, but also a story related boss at the middle point of most areas that you'll have to deal with. It's a lot more engaging and interesting than the fights in the first game, for sure, and the changes generally make every area feel more packed with content than they were in the previous two titles. It's interesting how much they improved the general flow of exploration here, because it leads to one of the biggest pacing issues Etrian Odyssey 3 has. Every stratum is one floor shorter than the past two entries. In the meantime, the power curve still acts the exact same way it does in the other Etrian Odyssey games, so you're expected to grow stronger at a faster pace than the game's dungeon itself allows for. This is partially mitigated by seafaring, which we'll get to later, and not mitigated at all by those rare gold FOEs who kind of work like Dragon Quest's metal slimes, although somehow even less reliable to grow from than a rare random encounter. You know things are bad when a fixed enemy on the map is less reliable than a rare random encounter. The pacing is something that's important to talk about in general, because all three Etrian Odyssey games had their own way of handling the pacing of the dungeon crawl. Etrian Odyssey 1 had a lot of healing locations in the dungeon, so you could grind there until your inventory filled up. Etrian Odyssey 2 had a lot of one-way temporary teleport locations, so you could jump back into a later floor of the stratum without making the climb back to where you wanted to level or progress. And Etrian Odyssey 3 makes the full stratum journey one floor shorter, with plenty of shortcuts to get to the deeper floors as soon as you've cleared a piece of content for the first time. It makes a lot of the bosses feel like bigger walls than they were in previous entries, as they can be pretty vicious difficulty spikes. Though nothing in this game ever felt as bad as Skyla in Etrian Odyssey 2. I'm not sure why the dungeons are one floor shorter than a traditional stratum, but I'd have to guess it's a concession they made to cram the entire rest of the game into a Nintendo DS cartridge, because Etrian Odyssey 3 is packed. A lot of the mapping limitations of Etrian Odyssey 1 were because the developers were already running into hardware limitations at the time. In Etrian Odyssey 2, this becomes increasingly noticeable, as the game has a bit of lag at the end of every turn in combat when there's an FOE on the floor. The game has to take a moment to calculate their movement before it can continue the action. I think Etrian Odyssey 3 is on a new engine, because playing the games so close to each other, the difference in how they run is really noticeable. When we talk about video games, we never really talk about how satisfying a menu can feel when a game is well-tuned for its hardware. Performance usually gets talked about in terms of action, which is understandable because that's when performance really counts to improve, well, the player's performance. But Etrian Odyssey 3's mapping feature feels a lot nicer to use now that the game's engine is running a lot better. There's also less of a delay moving the map screen around or going from menu to menu. It's all a big improvement. And I guess they must have freed up a lot of cartridge space in that engine move because they added a whole new game mode, too. A new feature that would be formative for a flagship feature in the 3DS sequel right after. Etrian Odyssey 3 lets you set sail and explore the open seas beyond the main town of Armor Road. This basically amounts to another exploration puzzle in a different format. Every voyage, you get a limited amount of turns to explore the surrounding area starting from the same base each time. As you discover new areas and make new item discoveries and trades along the way, you start unlocking more tools that'll help you explore further. So you can spend more turns on the sea with better food supplies, move more spaces at a time with stronger sills to get greater distances, and even break through areas blocked off by certain tiles, letting you get that little bit further extra out there, which in turn lets you find more items that let you get further ahead. This minigame isn't entirely standalone. There's two major rewards from exploring the seas. The first are limit breaks. Etrian Odyssey 3 has a new limit break system where your party has special abilities that you can assign to a group of party members. You find these abilities during your travels. A good chunk of these are rewards for reaching major milestone locations at sea, but some are found in the dungeon as well. They require a lot less setup to use than the Etrian Odyssey 2 ones, and although it's sad to see the special abilities that make individual units more unique go away, it does add some more choice and customization to the mix that I can appreciate. The other big reward from sailing to far-off lands comes from sea quests. There's a quest board filled with additional boss fights that unlock every time you find a new town exploring the seas. 
That quest board is where a lot of the writing fleshes out the world at large. Instead of just centering it around an adventurer's guild or a shopkeeper, individual characters have written out their pleas for help, and the writing for these are a treasure. I'm the night flying tribesman, who uh, must pass the ritual of adulthood with my childhood friend Rebecca. We must defeat that shark. Of course, we don't stand a chance alone. This is why we seek the cooperation of adventurers. Thanks to the explorers who opened up the route to Shiba, we can finally fish in a wider area now. In fact, thanks to the currents out of the Shiba area, I can hear you can pull up some pretty rare fish. As a fisherman myself, I can hear the call of the sea. Can you guard me so I can fish in peace, please? Mister? <laughs> Yee-haw! Me, at bar, get drunk, said beasts stronger than fish. But me not need drink to say that. But they laugh. Me got mad. Me show them. Me and beasts fight fish. Me need ship driver. There's so much character here, you can almost hear the voices, even though there's no voice acting in the game. Truly great character writing. Sea quests are great for plenty of reasons. The first is that these are repeatable boss fights. You can do them repeatedly without worrying about them having to respawn in a few days' time. The second is that they're a great showcase for a lot of the other classes that you haven't chosen and how to build around them. The quests don't just have flavor text for the other characters, they'll also join you in battle almost always with a skill set that counters the weaknesses of the bosses. This way you get some extra familiarity with the other classes and what they have to offer, which is great for reasons that we'll get into later. The fights themselves also drop some unique weapons and armor for your party, usually about two of them per quest, and every town has three quests against the same boss with different party loadouts. It's also accompanied by one of the best battle themes in the series up to this point. Just listen to this, it's great. You don't have to do sea quests to clear the game or anything, and if you really want to rush it, there's guides out there that give you the exact loadouts and movements required to get everything. But personally, I quite like that this game is testing your ability to keep track of your surroundings and forces movement puzzles on you, but then also does something very similar in a different format. I kind of wish you could interact more deeply with the other towns you find at sea though, but at the very least we learn a little bit about them through the sea quests anyway, so it's not a total loss. Armor Road as a starting town is pretty strong too. They are not as harsh to newcomers as the town in Etrian Odyssey 2 was, but at the same time, even early on, it's clear that there's some hidden agenda that's driving the town to their undersea explorations. Armor Road is a seafaring town, putting trade and commerce first. Abandoning ship for something as esoteric as adventuring is seemingly out of place for a town like that. At least the merchants and pub owners know how to put a good adventurer to use though. I quite like Missy, owner of the Butterfly Bistro. This is the usual hangout where you get your typical town quests for the dungeon, giving out experience points and items upon completion. Missy is an odd one, where it's hard to figure out if she's oblivious to what's going on or in complete control and feigning ignorance. Her dialogue is interesting too, because there's almost no consistency to how she talks, as if she's constantly shifting a pan-global accent, which only adds to the mystery of the character. It's great. We've also got Napier, the greedy shopkeeper who is always looking to make a profit at the cost of others. She secretly means well, but letting people know that wouldn't be good for business negotiations. She's easily one of my favorite shopkeepers in any game. Which is a good way to start talking about the expansion of the shop. Halfway through the game, you find the second town hidden away in the dungeon, the Deep City. Once you get there, Napier opens up another branch, and this one is run by her sister. Something about the duo together and their general attitudes and appearances, I can't help but see Lena Inverse and Naga the Serpent in them. I even thought that way before I learned that the character artist for the series actually did do some artwork for certain Slayers releases, or that in the novels, Lena is a merchant's daughter. The real important thing with this second town though is that it unlocks another new feature, subclassing. Subclassing lets you pick a secondary class on top of your original one, letting you learn any of their skills, except their single unique class skill. So theoretically, you can be dealing with the skill trees of 10 whole character classes across your team of 5 party members. In practice, you'll probably end up with a lot of gladiators to get charged. 
Now just because charge adds a lot of additional damage, because it does, but it also helps reduce TP cost for prolonged use, since your big damage dealers are going to cast their big ability once every two turns if you're charging it first, while also doing more damage than just spamming their big attack every turn. Gladiator is kind of broken in general. A lot of the classes that at best subclass into one, you're better off starting as them and then subclassing into the other role. And which classes are best subclassed into the gladiator role, you might ask? Well, pretty much every single one that deals damage. But Etrian Odyssey 3, while hard, isn't so unforgiving that you need to 100% optimize all the way and forsake all other build options. Especially not if you've got yourself a hype princess to keep the party motivated. That buys you a lot of space to fool around with. Most of what you really need in Etrian Odyssey 3 are big boss killing single hit abilities. Random mob disposing AoEs, buffs and debuffs, and some nice elemental damage. These are pretty much the basics in a lot of RPGs, but they're especially important to have all together in a single party here. You've got 5 slots to hit these targets especially well, and if your party of 5 can use a boost, the middle game gives you just that. Just in time to cover any holes your original composition might have had before the harder content starts hitting. That middle point is also when the story really unfolds, and it does at an interesting point. There's some mild spoilers ahead, so if you plan to play the game in the future and care about those, maybe skip ahead a little bit. During the first two stratums, you keep running into a party of two adventurers. The Murotsumi Guild. Agatha and Hypatia are trying to go deeper into the dungeon than they can get on their own. It doesn't seem especially serious early on, but as soon as they hit the second stratum, things go south. The group splits up as they're struggling internally, their motivations for pushing themselves to their breaking point starts coming out. And by the end, you get one single choice that influences the direction of the quest as it splits in two directions from here. Neither path really ends well for them. It's an interesting quest line. In a lot of games, I really wouldn't like this. One that comes to mind is how Dragon Age 2 handled whether or not you took your sister to the deep roads. With one choice, she dies. With the other choice, she's taken away. And with both, it's presented as your fault for choosing the wrong option. Even though there were no right options to make, you're made to feel guilty about having made both of them. Thankfully, Etrian Odyssey 3 doesn't feel this way about a questline with a very similar outcome. And the timing for this couldn't be better either. This quest plays out right before getting to the Deep City. And once you get there, the main story of the game starts to branch off into two different directions too. Etrian Odyssey 3 is a game that was made with the intent of replaying it to see all the sides of the conflict. And obviously, that first time you choose one option. The second time, you're going to choose the other option. The illusion that there was a correct choice to make isn't really hidden from the player here. The developers wanted you to find out that both endpoints were doomed from the start. When you get to the deep city and follow the story there, you're eventually put in front of a choice. There's a conflict of interest between the deep city and armor road. Both sides want the same thing and they want it done their way. And their way is only possible without the other side's interference. And again, sticking with one side or the other, it doesn't end well for either. Both endings ring hollow, like something is missing there. Which is because there's a third, hidden ending. The way you get to it isn't handled too nicely, you have to kind of play both sides to get certain items. And then instead of taking a mission to progress deeper into the dungeon at a certain point, you have to go to a cave to talk to what's basically the antagonist faction. This then puts you on the track to the good ending, where both sides set aside their differences and the journey into the postgame is properly tied to the story. It's a bit odd and not handled too neatly, but I kind of like it. Partially because the postgame dungeon is very clearly made with the intent of going into it after having gone through at least one New Game Plus loop. I can excuse a lot more difficult to manage or rigid design when it's not intended to be done on a first playthrough or part of the postgame. That's for the people who are really invested, and it's more than fair to ask more of those players than you normally would. Once you've cleared the game and get into New Game Plus, running through the dungeon again for a new playthrough doesn't take all that long. You get to keep your party and gear, and your map is still completely filled in. Though it's probably still best to retire your party first. 
Retiring a party member basically removes them, but lets you put a supercharged one in their place. They don't start at level 1 and they get a few bonus skill points and stats, making them much stronger when they're back at their old level. This is also a good time to maybe reconsider your party loadout, now that you're more familiar with the game. Though, you could just put the same party back together and make them a little bit stronger. And now that you're more familiar with what happened last time, maybe it's best to not get involved with Agatha and Hypatia this time and just tell them to buzz off every time you run into them. It's cold, but at least you won't let them push themselves beyond their means again. And the game gives you plenty of opportunities to tell them to get lost. It's clear that the game is trying to remind you of those dead ends that you're already familiar with. What they thought they wanted wasn't really what was best for them, and maybe without you egging them on, they'll move on with their lives instead. Just like the rulers of the Deep City and Armor Road, maybe sometimes you shouldn't encourage people when what they're doing is clearly wrong for them. It does make me wonder what a potential Etrian Odyssey 3 Untold would have been like had they made a story mode for it. The way the paths for both the first and second half of the game plays out, I almost expect a time loop plot where you keep going back to redo the events and maybe not screw it all up this time. Because the third option, to not get involved, makes it very clear your party knows more than they should, even if it's never directly acknowledged that you've gone through more than one loop. Anyway, that's enough spoilery talk. In case you skipped ahead, the short of it is that there's more than one ending, and there's some interesting ideas there. A lot of the story and how it keeps moving forward weirdly reminds me of some of Quintet's writing, Illusion of Gaia in particular, where adventuring is kind of terrible for almost everyone involved. Even if it's going well for you, most others who tried to get ahead fell short instead. This was a thing in Etrian Odyssey 2 as well, but 3 goes that little bit harder in some cases, keeping a sense of danger alive in a setting that I can appreciate. There's also FOEs. They're still around. The special colored ones with unique movement patterns like we had in Etrian Odyssey 2 are a thing of the past. I quite like that system, but I can see why it had to go. Etrian Odyssey 3 has a very different focus on dungeon exploration, and in general FOE movement patterns have been kept a lot simpler and easier to oversee in this game. So no more stealth FOEs that you can't track on the map. Compared to Etrian Odyssey 2, FOEs are kind of underwhelming in terms of presence here, resembling their use in Etrian Odyssey 1 a lot more, but at least they give experience points again. One last minor addition that I think is worth bringing up is how you deal with farming items in the dungeon. Item searching locations are still exactly the same, and they finally have easily readable map indicators this time around. After going through Etrian Odyssey 1 and 2, I'm very excited to actually be able to see if I can like cut, take, or mine at a location. And if that wasn't enough, we don't have to fish for useful skills across our parties anymore. In Etrian Odyssey 1 and 2, chop, mine, and take would be divided across different character classes. Each one had access to a different one. In Etrian Odyssey 3, every class has access to a standardized list of regular abilities. This includes things like raising your max HP and TP, but chop, mine, and take are now available to everyone. And on top of that, there's a new farmer class who get access to even more gathering abilities like raising the chances for the rare drops to occur, or the ability to just return to town without an item use. They've got some decent regular utility too, like improving the restorative effects of resting at a camp, so you could use them for a lot more than putting together a gathering party to maximize item gains in a single journey, especially with subclassing being a thing. I think this is a neat addition, since especially the early game, you're likely to run out of funds, and when that happens, you'd probably need to go on a gathering journey or two, so you don't go full dungeon meshy on the dungeon. So here's a good character class specifically to do just that. Etrian Odyssey 3 is an interesting game. Where Etrian Odyssey 2 felt like a repeat of the first game with some quality of life changes, the third entry feels like a much more solid step forward, with a major overhaul on a lot of basics, and a stronger identity of its own much additional content and a more ambitious story and setting than the first two outings. Etrian Odyssey 1 released in January of 2007 and its follow-up Etrian Odyssey 2 originally released in February of 2008. It's a pretty quick turnaround for a sequel to a game that intricate, especially when you consider that they changed directors between the two games. Kazuya Nino, who'd later go on to direct Dragon Quest Builders, directed the first game and Shigo Komori directed the second game, as well as the third entry, releasing three years later in 2010. 
He pretty much directed the entire rest of the franchise, including remakes, except the fourth entry. It explains a lot about how Etrian Odyssey 3 uses the original ideas as a launching point to head in a new direction. The result is probably my favorite Etrian Odyssey game and one of my favorite Nintendo DS games in general. I can't say for sure it's my favorite in the series until I've played 5 and Nexus, the two major entries I've not touched yet, but it's definitely the best entry on the Nintendo DS. If you play just one game of the original trilogy, I'd recommend this one. It's not perfect by any means, and there are some difficulty spikes here and there, but it's a very satisfying game to play through and beat, especially if you go for that true ending. Speaking of clear favoritism, I asked people on Patreon another important question. We've had two Etrian Odyssey games with standout character classes. So, which one's the best? Gunner or Princess? The Hype Princess won, almost unanimously, and no surprises there because I'd pick the princess too. Before we end the video, I'd like to thank Snakerer, Spicy Chicken God, and Mandalore Gaming for their parts in the video. You guys really helped bring the Sequest board come to life. If anyone watching isn't familiar with their output, I'll leave a link to their channel in the description so you can check them out. They all make very good stuff too. As always, if you enjoyed the video, maybe stick around and subscribe. I do intend to go for the 3DS entry and Odyssey titles at some point in the future. You might also be interested in the videos on the Saga series, since we've covered almost the entire series by now. Next time, we're taking singing lessons. As always, this video was brought to you by the people supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to become one of the names that you see scrolling on the screen right now, head over to patreon.com slash and I will, uh, see ya.